Hello to everyone and uh, uh, welcome. I did say I wasn't going to start off this podcast by saying welcome because I've started the other 22 podcasts by saying welcome, but unfortunately I don't seem to be able to find another way to start off. So welcome to everybody, well, uh, and in particular to Richard White, who has uh, very kindly agreed to uh, give us a, a talk on uh, a subject which is of direct relevance to primary dental care. Uh, although many dentists don't understand that or don't accept that and uh, the relationship between the medical profession, the dental profession and uh, uh, and the, the selling has been a difficult one and one that perhaps dentists have not wanted to face up to, uh, you know, are we selling? Do, do you sell health? And these are some of the interesting questions that Richard and I have uh, were mulling over when we um, were, were talking about, you know, what sort of presentation uh, the profession might like to hear. Um, Richard, as you can see, is um, an expert on soft selling. He's one of the UK's uh, leading experts. What is soft selling? Uh, I'm sure he's going to explain that. And, uh, of course, uh, the ethical part of it is very important to the profession that's involved in taking money in return for health in any case. So... Uh, I'm not. Uh, I, I shall leave him to uh, further introduce the subject because he's much more of an expert in it than I am. The we this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available online afterwards. So if anything is unclear, don't forget you can watch this again uh, and rewind or fast forward or, or, or whatever. So and also uh, you know forward it to people who may have missed it, uh, friends of yours. So during the presentation, also feel free to type comments or questions into the chat box and I'll put uh, them to Richard at the end. So, uh, bear with us while we swap over presenters, and I will say, Richard, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Derek, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so, soft selling, ethical selling, they're actually the same thing, and uh, it's really about selling with integrity. And so, I'm going to give you a, uh, a brief presentation, and I'm happy to take answers. Uh, just a little bit about myself, uh, I'm uh, a sales and marketing consultant for GetWise Marketing. I'm actually relatively new to the dental industry. Um, GetWise asked me to join them because they thought that I would be able to, with my soft selling background, be able to bring fresh ideas into the dental market. Um, so I, if, I, if I use the word client rather than patient, I really apologize. I've worked with a lot of different industries that do have similarities. So for example, I'm currently working with a clinic that does psycholo works in the area of psychology, um, and I've also worked with uh, lawyers and uh, IT people. The common thing amongst them all is they hate selling, and yet they need to sell in order to generate income for themselves and uh, their families. And so, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is really looking at this at a very strategic level. Um, you you run a dental practice, but you're also running a business, and business needs to make an income. And uh, a lot of people I come across, they like to earn more income, but they have a, have a bit of a problem with sales. And so, uh, when you really understand the essence of sales, then uh, often it's not a problem. You know, it's 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 like really getting your head around it. Uh, and really getting it organized within your business so it's not an issue. Uh, so for me, it's all about integrity. And I'll just give a little brief uh, background to my introduction to sales. I am not a natural salesperson. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I fell into sales uh, working for an IT practice. Uh, I was asked to build a, um, an Oracle consulting practice for a medium-sized IT consultancy. It was a friend that introduced me. Uh, and really the, 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 the attraction was the money, but when I realized that I had to sell, I really struggled. I got sent on sales training courses, that just made it worse because everything, all my negative uh, experiences in sales about being pushy, being manipulative, that was all reinforced by the sales training. So I needed to find a way of selling that I felt comfortable with, because for me, integrity is one of my uh, most important values. I can't lie to save my life, and yet I was expected to sell. So I went and found people 
that were really good at selling consultancy in a nice soft way and I respected them for their integrity. And uh, I've been researching over the last 15 years for what I call soft selling, but it's really about selling with integrity because uh, when you get uh, your head in the right place, then it's, it's really possible to feel okay and then feel good about sales. But um, it's really about seeing it in a different way. So I'm going to keep this at a fairly high strategic level rather than getting into techniques. Um, I do recommend, in terms of techniques, there's a really excellent interview that Derek has done for Dental Fusion with Tracy Stewart, and she has some very good techniques that will go well with this webinar. So the way I see sales is similar to um, uh, a knife. You can use a knife to butter bread, and you can use a knife to harm people. It's not the knife that's the fault, it's the person holding the knife. And it's the same with sales. It's like you can, sales is sales, but you can take someone who's pushy and manipulative and they can use the same techniques. They can use my soft selling techniques and apply it to sales and it will come across as pushy and manipulative, another ethical. But if you've got somebody who is uh, ethical at their core doing sales, then it'll always come across as, as, as ethical. And it's really about the mindset of that you bring to sales that makes a difference. So um, the core principle is really the golden rule. And the golden rule has been around for, for thousands of years. And it's really about um, do unto others what you'd have them do to you. And uh, the way I see it is that if you were in the patient's position, knowing what you know as the dentist, would you still go ahead? So if the answer is no, then for me, you do not sell, or you do not, you do not take it further. But if the answer is yes, then you definitely do. And uh, if you structure things so that it's all uh, patient-centric, so it's all focused on the best interest for your patients, then it becomes it becomes very easy, and um, I'll, I'll show you how. Uh, and it takes a different different way of thinking. Now, first of all, just to clear up uh, a, a couple of misunderstandings, uh, there's there's great misunderstanding between sales and marketing. There are actually two sides of the same coin, and uh, so marketing is really about generating interest. So you're 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 looking to attract new patients to your um, to your practice, and you're also marketing to existing patients as well. So you could have existing patients, and you're you're marketing uh, maybe tooth whitening services to them. But it's 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 really about the attraction. Uh, but marketing is more than just the communication. Marketing is about the product. So this is how you structure your practice. It's about the pricing, and it's also about how, how they consume the services as well. So once you generate interest in a particular um, uh, service, then you need processes to go from interest to uh, the sale. And just without doing anything else, I bet that if I was to do a mystery shopper exercise with a, with a random number of dental practices, and I pretend to be a uh, someone interested in, in dental services, I wonder how good um, a process I will receive in, uh, when, I, when I make that call. Would I, for example, be uh, asked why, why I'm looking to move dental practice? Will I be asked why I'm interested maybe in tooth whitening? Uh, what you need on sa from the sales point of view is to have good processes in, in place so that your staff can take the interest and turn it into uh, a new patient or turn it into someone who books for uh, uh, things like tooth whitening. And uh, so selling dentistry service is actually quite simple in terms of the uh, sales process compared to some of the other things that I get involved in. 
and it's very easy to script what people should say. Now, I'm not when I say script, I don't mean they read from a script. I mean that you you think it all through in terms of the process of what people need in order to um, say yes, at recognizing that not everybody will say yes. You'll get some inquiries, and some of them will not uh, turn into new patients, and some of them will. Um, and there's a thing in in sales called a conversion rate, but you know the more the more you can focus it around the patients and the different types of patient needs, the more um, inquiries you'll convert into patients uh, or you'll uh, convert into bookings for additional services. And the key, the key to making this easy, the key to really not having to push uh, and having uh, your patients uh, buy your services rather than you having to sell them, which is the ultimate. I mean, that's the ultimate in soft selling is people buy from you uh, and you make it easy for people to buy from you rather than you having to sell. Um, it's really to understand the buying motivation. And, and Derek and I was talking about uh, when, we were, when we were doing our discussions beforehand as to what, what you most might want to hear about. Uh, one of the things we were talking about is um, uh, dental practices that are providing NHS services and how do, how do you get NHS uh, patients to be interested in going private. So I'm really going to be using that in terms of, of uh, demonstrating buying motivation, but it could be that you have different buying motivations for different products and services, but it's really understanding why people buy and people buy for different reasons. So let's just look at some buy motives. So you, you get an inquiry coming into your practice, and uh, uh, let's assume that they already have a current dentist. Why are they making that phone call? People do not do th things without a reason. People do not make an inquiry without a reason. So actually asking them why, um, why they're looking to move dental practice or why, they're, uh, why they made the call will give you some valuable information. Now, one of the reasons might be that they're looking to save money. So they could be, for example, uh, with a private practice and they're looking to save money uh, by going NHS. It's important to know that, that sort of information. It could, it could actually be that people who are interested in saving money are actually, if, if there's a certain treatment that um, by going private you get a better, uh, longer lasting solution, and it saves money in the long term, they may be interested in, in that rather than um, a, a short-term fix. But saving money could be one buying motive for uh, making that call. Another one could be flexibility. So if you imagine that certain people are, are uh, their work causes them to not really know, not really be able to plan ahead, um, and they need to be able to book at very short notice. So one of the reasons why they could be calling is that they're looking for more flexibility in, in being able to book um, for, for a dental practice. So maybe they, they need something really short term. Now another one could be uh, convenience. So people are working, um, you know, and they can't get time off work to go to the dentist, so maybe they want to have an evening appointment or maybe they want a weekend appointment. But they're looking for more convenience that they're not getting from their existing a dentist. Comfort is another thing. Um, now this is quite an interesting one. So, so some people may be coming from, from a, 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 another dental practice and they're just looking for something a little bit more um, plush and palatial. Um, and you could potentially um, uh, build in this into your, into your practice in terms of having more comfort. Um, for example, uh, it, is, it is just, this is just an example. It's not. I'm not recommending it. But in, if you have the room, you could have a. Uh, you could have one room which is a uh, an NHS waiting room, and another room which is a uh, a private um, uh, waiting room. You could have actually, if you've got two different locations, you could put one NHS and one private. But you know, it it's, it's enables them to have a difference. Um, the other, the other thing could be quality. So this is quality of the service. If they don't think they're being treated very well, 
they may be moving for, from a quality of service. But understanding these buying motives enables you to potentially change what you're doing because at the core of it, if there's no difference between an NHS experience and a private experience, then why would they, you know, people would generally go for the lowest price. Um, and Derek, Derek was sort of joking with me about, uh, with some practices, it, the only difference between uh, NHS and private is, is that you get a free cup of tea. Um, you, need to net, you need to look at your business model and look at how you um, add extra value so people are prepared to pay for that extra value. And without that, um, it's really hard to sell. But when you look at the buy motives and you look at how you are going to be dealing with them, then it becomes easier. For example, with flexibility, you could have um, your, your dental practice where NHS patients need to book in advance um, and private patients can book at short notice. You could have it that uh, uh, NHS dentists uh, or only private patients can uh, have bookings at the weekend or the evening. You could, as I said, you could have a different levels of, of, meet, of, of waiting room and uh, there could be different levels of quality of experience and so on. But it's really about how you build that into your, uh, into your practice um, and having something to sell. So I'm going to give you some examples of this in, in, in another industry just to really help you see that um, you know, there, there, are, there are different ways of doing things. So if you look at the British Airways flight, um, you know, the same plane is going to the same location and the majority of people on the plane are flying economy. They're happy to fly economy, um, the price is right and so on. And there are some people who fly business because uh, they want the extras that you get from business. So for example, generally in, in business you get to go on the plane uh, sooner, you don't have to queue, you get to come off the plane sooner, you get extra allowance for luggage and so on. But there are different service levels. If you have just one service level, then it's really hard. You know, if there's no difference between private and NHS, why would people pay the extra? You, you, there needs to be a difference. Um, there is a different way that you could look at this as well. It's looking at uh, the EasyJet type model. So EasyJet they have just one plane. Everybody gets the same kind of the same kind of seat. Um, and if you if you're very quick, you get onto a really good seat. And if you're not, then then fine. You 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 just sit where you uh, where you can. Um, but you can buy extra services. For example, you can buy speedy boarding. Now I hate queuing, so I'll fly easy jets, but I'll always get speedy boarding because I don't like to have to queue up for three quarters of an hour. And I like to, to just be able to whistle through. But I will pay extra for that and I will value that. And I know what it's like to, uh, to do it and I know what it's like to not. So you could have just one, one level of service, but you can have extra services. So, so for example, um, and I'm not recommending this, but it's conceivable that you, you could actually charge extra for booking, um, booking uh, on a weekend or booking on an evening. Uh, if you're if you're adopting an EasyJet model, you could charge extra for for additional services. And um, Ryanair, the masters of this, and uh, I recently went to Czech Republic on a Ryanair flight, and they actually had the first two seats that could actually be booked for people who wanted extra legroom and the and the, and the business travellers. Um, now, in sales terms. Um, you even if you're doing private, even if you have a private practice, uh, finding new patients is going to be uh, less profitable because you have to pay for the cost of the marketing. Um, but once you've got the patient, then um, selling additional services to your patients becomes uh, very profitable because you don't have to pay so much for the marketing. And uh, so you, you do need to consider how good you are at promoting uh, value-added services to your customers, um, bearing in mind the different buying motivations and, you know, putting it across in an ethical way. But once, uh, as you said before, once, the, once you've generated interest, then you have a process to be able to deal with that interest and uh, 
and see if they want to book or not. Now, this all seems might seem great, and I know it sounds easy, but um, really nothing will change within your organization. It doesn't matter whether you're a dental practice or, or what type of organization you are. If you have an anti-sales culture, it's going to be very difficult. If you, um, if you have an anti-money culture, now I, I speak from experience with this because my brother-in-law um, actually set up a dental practice. And he was NHS through and through. You know, if you cut him, it'd be <laughs> NHS, um, you know, like a stick of rock. Uh, and he loved the dental practice, but he really didn't like this idea about uh, private, uh, private practice, and he wasn't really that interested in the money side. But ultimately, he had to sell his practice because he couldn't afford it anymore. You know, it, it, it's like if you want to see this uh, as just... As I mean, you basically need to be seeing this as a business as well as the fact that you're running a dental practice. You know, and and you you without that sort of sales friendly culture, then it's going to be very hard to change. Um, even if you're going to get all your staff to follow processes, because um, it all starts at the top. So I'm just going to recap. Uh, with ethical selling, you have to act with your patient's best interest at heart. You really do, and I believe all of you listening do do that. Um, that's one of the hallmarks of, of people who are really good at what they do uh, in professional services. Um, and you get rewarded for adding value to patients. So if you're not adding any extra value to, um, to patients for going private, why would they? So if you can start looking at how you could add extra value to them, then there could be additional reasons for them to wanting to go from NHS to private, or, or at least uh, do private uh, services. Uh, and you need to be seen as a trusted advisor. And if you, if you act uh, with uh, integrity and the, the patient's best interest at heart, you will not be seen as anything but a trusted advisor. But you do need to understand your patients. You need to understand and get in, in, process, in, in, sorry, get in place processes. Uh, and you need a sales-friendly culture. So uh, that's been a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour, but I'm really happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have um, on uh, ethical selling. That's great. Thank you, Richard, very much. Let me just uh, uh, put the uh, screen back up again. Maybe a second. There we are. Lovely. Now, um, we have had a couple of questions, so let me uh, just go straight to those. Um, just uh, incidentally, I mean, that, that I think you need to do another one of these, because I think we need to know a lot more of you. Uh, you're... you're really dealing there with the absolutely core subject that is, of, you know, I know having done sort of two or three private conversions is so um, uh, critical to um, the, what we need to do as a profession. Uh, it, it's quite true that if you're being sold too well, it's a very, very pleasant experience. We've all can remember times when we were excited about buying something, whether it's a new car or, or whatever, and, and the salesman was really fantastic. And, and they're some of the most e exciting and pleasant times, experiences in our lives. But conversely, of course, when you meet someone with uh, a very poor product knowledge, for example, uh, who stands between you and what you're trying to do, um, then, then of course it's a nightmare. And um, I've just come back from Cologne, International Dental Showcase, and you can get the Gatwick Express, which everybody knows uh, is very well marketed, you, they, they sell the tickets on board the plane, uh, it's very expensive, or the local train, which takes about three minutes longer and costs half as much. Uh, is one more crowded than the other? Uh, because if 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 the lower price one is really crowded, then the, some people would be prepared to pay more for for having that extra space. Just like some people uh, will shop in in, in Waitrose because they, the, the the aisles are wider. You're not really bumping into people, and uh, it's the whole experience. Is is you know a lot of the food's the same. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, the M6 uh, round Birmingham is another good example, isn't it? You can see these examples all the time. They build a motorway, they make it a toll motorway. If uh, you do want to drive on a, an uncongested stretch of motorway, then you can pay your five quid or whatever and, and do it, and you still get to where you're going to go but uh, of course you're paying there I suppose for to save time so there are hundreds of ways that we can differentiate our service aren't there it, it, without um, uh, compromising in terms of the clinical quality I think one of the problems is uh, and this is a real thing about uh, people who um, people who are technicians tend to be very task focused uh, I used to be very task focused um, and and I had to learn to be very empathetic and now I, do, I just do it naturally but I had to learn it, and uh, you know some some people are naturally gifted pe people people, and uh, I would advise that you know you have your 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 um, your practice staff that's interacting with the public as being very people people, uh, and they could handle all these things. But but uh, you need to be able to see things from the client's perspective rather than your own, and when you can get a good match between the two, then then you will become. Uh, much better. It's, it's, it's you know, there, there, there's, there's, there's different ways of putting the same message across. Uh, and sometimes, um, I mean, I, I, I just give an example of um, my, my dentist, and I had to have. Uh, he, he told me that I had to have four crowns done, but the way he put it across was I had to have them all done all at the same time. And, and actually, when I <laughs> challenged him later. He said, "Oh no, you don't have to have them all done at the same time. You know, it's, it's probably going to be like one a year." It's, 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 um, I was just saying that you had to have it done eventually. Well, I actually delayed my decision because I didn't want to have them all done at the same time. Uh, and yet, if he had have explained that to me better, I would have booked it in that day. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, th I think the um, the way in which things are put across is, is, is important and it's, it's really about having the patient's best interest at heart but also being able to communicate that um, in their language. So you would say if you had um, a member of staff who was naturally gifted at explaining things to the patients and, and uh, telling them what all the options are and what the choices are and everything then obviously you want to make sure that that is the member of staff that the patients are dealing with don't you and if you've got someone who as you say is not not a people person or perhaps has an anti-sales um, mentality then you want to get that person off the desk don't you ideally <laughs> straight away yes, yes definitely and uh, you know I don't know I know Tracy has been doing some great work with with with, um, with with dental practices and helping them to handle inquiries and so on and you know as I said I, I'm sure that I could do some 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 uh, mystery shoppers in different dental practices and some will be really good at handling those inquiries uh, and knowing exactly what to say to people in order to to encourage them to become patients um, and others will, 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 will do it really badly um, uh, and the worst is that they don't have any process and they, they just leave it to chance and if you're, if you're spending money on marketing um, then really you're just wasting it unless you have that process in place to convert the inquiries in, 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 into patients. Now um, Richard has said um, who sells? Is it the staff or the dentist? Whose responsibility is it? I know you might say it's both but I mean principally should the dentist be spending his time selling or drilling? Um, that's a good question. I think, I think that the dentist can um, uh, can almost like uh, generate an inquiry by 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 making um, you know talking to the to the customers and so on. But if if the dentist is is not comfortable at uh, doing that, then I would just um, work in conjunction with the staff to say to, you know to get them to speak to you know so they, they can say uh, so somebody could um, have some heavily discolored teeth um, and the dentist might say uh, have you ever considered um, uh, tooth whitening? And they say, oh yes, I have actually. I've been thinking about it lately. Um, and, and they say, well, no problem. Just you know, if you go and see such and such on your way out, um, they can give you some more information and just handle it off like that. It's, it's really about understanding the process that you're going to follow uh, within your practice, and and it's better to design it based on what works for you, rather than um, you know having this is this is the only way that works. 
Um, you know, if 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 if, a, if it's a small dental practice and you don't have that ability, then you know the dentist will have to cope with it. That's great. And uh, one one more question that's come in. Uh, it's about market research. Um, actually, incident, incidentally, EasyJet uh, now does have seat reservations. They've abolished all that running on the plane thing. Uh, so unfortunately, <laughs> so you can't you can't get your speedy boarding anymore because you are given. They do now. I think from t April twenty third, they're going to go move to online booking. Uh, you know, uh, online checking in only, which means that everyone will have a seat number. But they do. You do obviously. You have to pay for your drinks. So if you want uh, the flight experience to include any refreshments, then you have to. You know, you, you're paying. And uh, they even differentiate between the coffee because you can have the ordinary coffee or the uh, upmarket branded coffee, which is advertised on, on on all the seat backs. Yeah, the Costa coffee. But what they do do is a lot of market research after you've flown with them. You literally get an email questionnaire through saying. What did you think of the boarding process? Did you know? Did the pilot say hello? Did everybody say wave goodbye with a tear in their eye when you left the plane, etc.? So, do you think uh, um, you know we should be doing much more market research? Well, well, there is um, when you when you're saying that, I was thinking about something which is used, and I'm actually working on a project with um, a, a big company on this, um, and that's called the Net Promoter Score. And that's quite good. It's quite easy to do, and you can do it with uh, um, SMS um, messaging. But it's uh, the, what the Net Promoter Score um, says is, is a very simple question: How willing would you be to recommend us to your friends and family? And um, it, you give a score between one and ten, and based on that, you're able to see how good the experience is, um, and and then feedback on you know what do we need to do to improve that score. Uh, it's very simple but effective. Um, I think the the way that I like to do market research because it can actually get quite expensive. Uh, if it's an established business, I like to look at the the uh, existing patients. I have this process I call five star. Um, uh, you know, in, in other industries, I call it five star clients. So you call it five star patients. And what do you what you do is you 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 list out all of the things that are really important to you. In, if you think about your different patients that you have, and some of them will be really great and some of them will be not, you know, a bit troublesome. Uh, you might have the patient from hell and that sort of thing, but you list out all the important qualities and then you pick the top five uh, and then you go through your patient list and, and then score them so that you can see um, what type of person is an ideal patient. And the more you understand about the profile of the ideal patient, um, and then you go on to see what their buying motivations are, um, then it makes it easier to market to them. Because um, this this thing about buying motivation, if you if you if you make a marketing a marketing message specific to a buying motivation, it becomes a lot more potent, and you get a much better response. So, if, for example, um, you're in your dental practice, you have uh, convenient uh, times for, for private patients, uh, so Saturdays or evenings or something like that. You might want to do a marketing piece just about that. You might want to communicate that to the community so people that are looking to book um, you know, awkward hours um, are attracted to you. Um, but it's, it's really, it, you know, you start with your patients, your existing patients. I think uh, that that's excellent. Uh uh, excellent advice and I know from my own experience in the practice that um, we had a system whereby I think we uh, NHS patients were encouraged let's put it this way to book between about 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock and uh, times before 10 and times after 3 were um, kept free for people who wanted to come in at short notice and uh, you, you, you can do all this it's not unethical in my opinion to do all this I think you would you would need to plan it and do it gradually. You know, if I if I was a patient and, and I was used to getting getting a certain level of, of service, um, uh, I would I would prefer to get a warning that it's going to change rather than it just changing. You know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's why I think we can explore this in a future webinars because. Um, 
you you know, you know first of all there's the issue of uh, patients getting 10 pound notes for a fiver i mean if they, if you've been giving them 10 pound notes for a fiver for the last 10 or 20 years then and then you stop doing that then of course they're going to get upset i mean anyone would wouldn't they um, now whether it's reasonable for them to get upset of course is another matter um and but um uh, the other thing is that uh, you are I think you're entitled to book, I mean, for example, some people keep Saturday mornings for private patients only, and um, I, in particular, like to see children in the morning, and that was because the children were, once they'd been slung out of school, they were all very fractious, they were exhausted, they'd been thrown out of school because they were exhausted, the teachers were exhausted, and of course, a harassed parent used to bring an exhausted child in to have a filling done about four o'clock in the afternoon, by which time I was a bit exhausted as well. And you can imagine, um, you know, it's a recipe for disaster. So if we were ever doing any sort of conservation on children, I used to ask the parents to bring them along at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, of course, they didn't want to do that because it meant a day off school. And it meant a day off work in most cases because, uh, you know, they'd have to take the day off to, to and then hang around to bring the child in. But clinically, it was absolutely 100% the best decision I ever made because we had so much less trouble and the children had a such so much of a nicer experience um, and they quite like the day off you know so i think you you have to run your surgery how you think it, it is going to work best and if that means insisting that certain patients come in at certain times or domiciliaries are only done when it's convenient for you and not necessarily when it's convenient for them i know we're going off track a bit there but um, I, I do think you have the right to run the business in the way that you know you you feel it needs to run but there's, there will be a way of communicating that positively so that people get it. And there, there may be some patients that, that don't like it and they might leave, but you'll attract more patients who are willing to spend more money who will like it. So it's, but but it, it needs to be planned, definitely needs to be planned. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really looking at, um, you know, this... The, 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 the misconception of marketing is uh, people think about marketing in terms of websites and in terms of, you know, Twitter and all that sort of thing. But that's just marketing communication. The product, the basic product, this is what we're talking about, is, is the experience of, of how you deliver your services. And that's, you know, how people can book. That's all part of your marketing, which is, um, uh, you know, what you're selling, <laughs> essentially. Right. Well, I've, uh, we've, we've kept you talking uh, for as long as your presentation. I, <laughs> we've sort of doubled the length of the presentation just by having a chat. But uh, I, you're a fascinating guy, and I think we need to get you back because there's, there's certainly, as you can tell, I'm, it's a subject in which I'm very interested in, and I think you've got a lot more to tell us. This is a new time for the webinars. We're trying uh, 5.30 instead of 1.10 lunch hour. So if you're listening or watching, please let us know what you think, feedback, and uh, if there are other, any other ways that you think we can improve on this service. If you've enjoyed the webinar, then please share it on the Twitter accounts and on Facebook as, as it's completely free. Richard is always happy to talk to um, Dental Fusion members and anyone else who'd like to contact him. He contributes to the Fusion magazine. So if you're a member get in touch particularly if you've got any other subjects that you'd like him to cover we're trying to encourage people to listen to these webinars and join dental fusion so we're offering a discount code to anyone who listens to this podcast either live or in its recorded form on youtube if you enter the code 1971 when buying a membership online at www.dentalfusion.org you will get 10% off either practice or associate membership and this is valid until the 31st of December 2013 and don't forget DCPs can join for a pound that gives you access to the one hour free verifiable CPD that all DFO members get for watching these webinars so that about wraps it up I didn't manage to avoid saying great or wonderful but I'll try my best next time I uh, hope it's been helpful and thanks for your time and attention <laughs>